This video introduces the F test. I'll start by discussing what the test does, mostly in a conceptual sense, and then cover its implementation in R. So the goal of the F test is to compare the variance between two samples. So remember that statistical methods test a unique null hypothesis, which in the case of the F test is that the two samples come from populations with the same variance. You could also think of it as saying that population variance sigma squared one is equal to population variance sigma squared two. These are the requirements or the assumptions for performing an F test. So you should think about them as you're deciding if this is the correct test to do for the data you have and, and the situation. First, your data must be measured with a continuous variable that's divided into predetermined categories or groups. You must have univariate data, which means comparing only a single variable or a single thing that's being measured between the samples. The F-test compares only two samples and it's designed to compare dispersion, specifically variance, between those two samples. Finally, the F-test is a parametric test, so that means the data that you're looking at must be normally distributed. The F-test is based on a very simple statistic. It's just the ratio of the two sample variances. S squared variance of sample 1 divided by variance of sample 2. So if the null hypothesis is true, this means that the two populations have the same variance. Therefore, the F statistic is most likely to equal 1. But of course, it might differ slightly from 1 because the two samples are randomly taken from the population. So given that, we want to know the probability of observing an F value at least as extreme as the one we did. So remember, that's the definition of the p-value, which is one of the main outputs of these sort of statistical tests. To answer that, we can use the F distribution. And this distribution just shows the probability of finding any particular value of the F statistic for a given sample size, at least, if the null hypothesis is true. Uh, the distribution is actually based on degrees of freedom, which in this case is sample size minus 1, because we're essentially using 1 to calculate the mean in, when you calculate the variance. Um, so in the, uh, here I've used M to represent the degrees of freedom in sample 1 and N for the degrees of freedom in sample 2. So each sample will have its own degrees of freedom. Both of the distributions on the bottom um, are F distributions. They show the probability of finding a particular value um, if the null hypothesis is true. So the distribution on the left, uh, well, I guess, first of all, note that both of them have a peak at 1, indicating the most probable value for f is 1, as you'd expect if the null hypothesis was true. But the distribution on the left, which has larger sample size with larger degrees of freedom, uh, indicates that you know, the expected values of f are all fairly close to 1. It's pretty unusual to find a value smaller than 0.75 or bigger than 1.25. And that's because large samples are less likely to just randomly differ from the population they come from. But the distribution on the right with small sample sizes will allow somewhat large deviations from one before it might raise suspicions that they're really different. Because uh, we might expect that small samples may just randomly be weird relative to the, the population they come from. So remember that this F distribution, this, this curve here, gives the expected probabilities for the F statistic if a null hypothesis is true. And we want to know what is the probability of finding a value more extreme than our F statistic if the null hypothesis is true. So in that sense, the p-value is just the area under the distribution for F statistics as least as, at least as extreme as the one you observed. And normally this will be in both directions, either greater than or less than 1, uh, because we're normally just considering the alternative hypothesis that there is any difference in the variance. So the F-test makes two assumptions. The first is that the two samples are independent of one another. And this is generally true in, in Earth science data. I'd say the most common exception to this would be if your two samples are just measurements of the exact same items made at two different times. But if that's not the case, then there's a good chance they're independent of one another. The second requirement is that both samples are normally distributed. The data in each sample follows a normal distribution. Unlike the t-test in the previous video, which can be a little bit forgiving for this assumption, the f-test is actually quite sensitive. 
And if you perform an F test on non-normal data, what ends up what you end up with is an increased risk of type one error. Remember, type one error is the is the when you reject the null hypothesis if it is in fact true. And also remember that all of these tests assume that the sample that you're working with is representative of the population. It's not biased in, in whatever way. So in R, the F test is, is this function called var.test, variance test, basically. And it works in much the same way as the T test. The F test is for two samples, and so you must input two numeric vectors. And these are often going to be columns of a data frame or output from a subset command, which you, you've learned about. And these two numeric vectors that you're inputting are separated by a comma here. Uh, the default is to do a two-tailed test, and that's what you're going to do nearly all of the time. But if you do want to specify a one-tailed test, it also works in the same way as the t-test function. You can just write alternative equals less or, or greater after the two input variables. Remember to put the variables first, and you need two of them. The output of the F test is also fairly self-explanatory, um, and it's very similar to the t-test output that you saw last time. It tells you the test that you ran. It gives the test, test statistics, the F, the degrees of freedom, both of them, remember there are two, one for each sample, and the p-value. It tells you the alternative hypothesis that you're using, in this case um, specified as a ratio, but if the ratio is not equal to one, that just is the same thing as saying there is a difference in the variances. Um, the output also gives you the 95% confidence interval on the ratio of sample variances, as well as giving you the actual ratio of variances. But the last point is not really that useful. We don't necessarily need to care about the actual ratio of variances, and we shall explain on the next slide. So here's how you should report the results of an F test if you're writing them in a paper or for your problem sets for this class. You should give the standard deviations of both samples. So even the F test is testing for differences in the variance. Variances are measured in units squared, and it's kind of awkward, and the standard deviation has much more intuitive units. So report the standard deviations of the samples. You should also give the value of the F statistic, both of the degrees of freedom, the p-value. So you could phrase your, uh, your results something like this. You would say, you know, variability in river incision rates did not differ significantly between sandstone channels. I've given the standard deviation with its units, as or granite channels, I've given the standard deviation for that. Then I write F in parentheses is, are the two degrees of freedom. There is the F statistic and the p-value. And remember, no, if the p-value is very tiny, you can just say less than 0.01. That's kind of a standard thing that you can do.